for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I appreciate a lot of the questions that have been asked today. Let me ask uh, some questions. I agree that we ought to figure out how we need to do this. In regard to the situation that uh, Mr. Dingle just mentioned in Utah, uh, was the gentleman charged with any other crimes as a part of his uh, scheme? I don't recall right now. Uh, it's one second. Or maybe I can get back to you if we can go ahead with another. That'll be fine. Because the, the previously you correctly stated that a lot of times there are other charges that can be brought, and that those may carry uh, additional time. And so I guess what I would ask you is, is that since law enforcement can bring other wire fraud, mail fraud, whatever other charges, uh, are you seeing that prosecutors are looking at that and and raising up the priority on these crimes? And do we need to look at at raising? the penalties, or do we just need to encourage the prosecutors to go forward on all, all fronts as opposed to just one? Yeah, I, I think what's happening, um, uh, Congressman Griffith, is that when the case is initially presented to the prosecutor, they're not going to know whether they're going to be able to prove the fraud. So if they prove fraud, mail fraud's maximum penalty is 20 years, wire fraud's 20 years. You know, if I sell you a fake Rolex and mail it to you, I'm going to get hammered. But they don't know if they're going to be able to prove that, and that's going to require a lengthy, years-long grand jury So that's what discourages the prosecutions? It, up front. Now, they, they're going to stack the charges right. as best they can if they prove it. Sure. Now, obviously, you've got a better shot with somebody in Utah of apprehending the individual than you do if they're from some foreign nation. Uh, do you think that there's a better chance of, of collecting if we raise the, uh, the penalties or the civil penalties and criminal penalties on the financial side more than the prison time, would that have a greater impact on the foreign import? Jason? I think enhancing, for example, asset forfeiture and seizure mm -hmm. uh, would make a big effect because we can then take the money, right? Uh, which would have a big effect, deterrence, and also just reducing the upside of engaging in the criminal activity in the first place. And, and I would agree that, that a lot of times that helps law enforcement in other fields, and maybe this is one of those areas where we need to you know, agree with Mr. Dingle when he said that perhaps we need to see that that the enforcement agency gets at least a portion of those funds back to help them go after other bad actors in this area. Uh, I do appreciate that. Um, let me ask you this, because you talked earlier about the prioritization of the various crimes by a prosecutor. If we raise these penalties up, at what point do we then deprioritize something else that we may consider important? I refer you to the Department of Justice. Uh, no, I, I, I mean, obviously, that always, that always is a problem. And to a prosecutor, every case is, you know, like their baby. But, uh, you know, th these are ones, I think, because they're not common to, it's not, a, prosecutors, a white-collar prosecutor will see tip mail fraud cases a lot, typical ones. They'll see, you know, dominant rollback case, mm -hmm. much more than they would see a counterfeit drug case. And so they're, they're not, we, we'll present the public health risk and, you know, and we'll convince them, and we're not saying Department of Justice is not cooperative. They are. It's um, just the maximum punishments reflects Congress's sense of the priority. And you go to court, you have a trial. We have a, we have a case of a, a, an oncology, uh, un unapproved oncology drugs. There was a trial, I believe, late last year. The person was um, convicted of over 20 misdemeanors, and they were just misdemeanors. And to, you know, a rational prosecutor, do you want to spend a couple of years investigating what turns right. out to be a misdemeanor? Sure. Let me switch gears, and I know it's not uh, your area of jurisdiction, but I would ask you to take the message back. Um, we've been talking about FDA's authority over drug supply chain, the Jug Drug Quality and Security Act. Uh, that also had uh, in it uh, an issue of co compounded drugs. Uh, again, I know it's not your jurisdiction, but I'm continuing to follow the FDA's regulation activities. In that area, I would remind the agency that uh, the DQSA was supposed to preserve the status quo when it comes to compounding drugs for office use and the repackaging of sterile drugs. Unfortunately, we're, we're starting to see some uh, reports that indicate that warning letters are being sent to prohibit these activities by traditional pharmacies, which were going on before we passed the bill, and right. there was kind of an agreement between the House and the Senate we'd leave that as a status quo. So I'll just keep if you take it back, just tell them we'll keep monitoring this, but I am concerned about that. And okay. Appreciate the work you're doing here today, and this hearing has been great. Thank you for your testimony, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir.